this chapter, we're going to start talking about animal diversity. There are many characteristics that group animals together and separate them from the other groups of organisms that we've seen so far. For example, all animals are multicellular, all animals reproduce sexually, all animals are diploid throughout the entire life, so they don't have this haplodiplontic cycle as plants had. They're also capable of movement, although this is not true for all animals. The majority are capable of movement or at least can move at a certain time in their life. Uh, so let's look at sexual reproduction. So when we talked about plants and algae and other protists, we saw how they can have this alternation of generations where they can have organisms, multicellular organisms that are haploid and multicellular organisms that are diploid. This does not uh, happen in animals. So in animals, they are always diploid, and the only time that they are haploid is the gametes, which are just a single cell, the sperm and the ovum, and those cells do not reproduce, and the only function that they have is to carry genetic information until fertilization and the formation of the cycle. Once the cycle forms, which is now diploid, the combination of the mother and the father's genes, that cycle can then reproduce and form an organism. There is no alternation of generation in animals. Another key innovation in the evolution of animals was the appearance of symmetry. So if you look at a plant or a protist or algae, they don't really have a specific symmetry. But in animals, we're going to see that there are two types of symmetry mainly. Another thing is the more complexity of tissues, organization of, of cells into tissues with separate functions. We also have the formation of a body cavity in some animals, which is very important for increasing in size, and uh, a very organized embryonic development that determines the diversity of animals. Another key innovation was the appearance of segmentation, so the repetition of identical structures that allows animals to grow larger without having to create new structures or invent new structures. So let's look at symmetry. The first animals are the least complex of all the animals are sponges and they lack any symmetry. So if you see the sponge, there's really no way you can divide it and have two mirror image of itself. It just, there's no real symmetry. But when we move to the next group of animals, for example, cnidarians like this anemone or jellyfish and also corals, they have radial symmetry. What this means is you can divide the animal in any plane that goes across the center and you will have two mirror images. So here you can see those black lines. You can divide it in infinite number of lines and you will have identical halves that are the mirror image of each other. And these animals that have radial symmetry, like these cnidarians, usually are sessile, which means they don't move. Or if they do move, like jellyfishes, they do move, but they don't move very fast and they don't have a clear direction of movement. So in that case, it's good to have radial symmetry because you can encounter prey from any side. If you don't move, your prey can come from any angle. Or you can have predators or have threats from any angle as well. So there is no clear direction where things will come to you. So radial symmetry is good for animals that don't move very fast. But some animals, so starting with flatworms, for example, there was the invention of bilateral symmetry. symmetry. Now, when I say invention, I don't really mean like these animals came up with this idea, but through mutations they developed to have this bilateral symmetry and this provided enough advantages that it was eventually selected forward. So these animals have bilateral symmetry. What it means to have bilateral symmetry is that there is only one way in which you can divide the animal and have two mirror images. And that's alongside with the animal if you divide it into left and right. Left and right will be mirror image of each other. And this was very important because once you have this bilateral symmetry, you have a clear front and a clear rear. So you have an anterior part, which is the head, you could say, and a posterior part, which is the tip. And this direction is great for movement. So now once you have a direction for movement, you have a place where you're going to encounter things. So you're more likely to run into things on the head. So if you're going to run into prey, most likely your head is going to encounter it first, than your tail. The same thing with a predator. If you're moving, it's more likely you find it forward than on the back. So this place gives a 
strategic location to place in sensory organs. If you want to see your prey, you're going to put your eyes towards the front, which is the place that's going to encounter them first. If you're going to have a nose, then your olfactory organs will have to be, the receptors will have to be towards the front, which is also the first part that is likely to encounter any scent from your prey or your predators. So this means that most of the senses will be located towards the head. And once you have all the sensory organs in the head, now you're going to need a nervous system or a nervous tissue to interpret the information that those senses are getting. So this means having this bilateral symmetry that allows for movement, that gives an orientation, and a placement for the sensory organs is also promoting the formation of a brain. And this is called cephalization. So once you have a place where all your sensory organs are placed, now you're going to need the nervous tissue to process that information and that has to be as close to those senses as possible. So the flatworms that are the first ones to have bilateral symmetry can really have a fully developed brain, they are at the beginning of the process of cephalization. So bilateral symmetry allowed animals to move and the movement led to having the sensory organs placed at the front and that eventually led to having a brain towards the front. In addition to symmetry, another key innovation of animal groups was the appearance of tissues that are a group of cells that are working together for a specific function. These tissues in part evolved because of the appearance of different germ layers. These are three main layers that cells organize themselves during the process of development. These three layers are called the ectoderm, which is the outermost layer. That is the one that gives rise to the skin and the nervous system. The mesoderm, that gives rise to our blood, our muscles, our bones. And the endoderm, that gives rise to the inner lining of our digestive tract. Not all animals have three germ layers. The most basal animals, like sponges, don't have any germ layers at all. Cnidarians, like jellyfish and corals, they have two germ layers. But all animals after that have three germ layers. Another key innovation for animals was the formation of body cavities. And so most animals have some sort of cavity, starting with cnidarians, with jellyfish and corals. They have a gastrovascular cavity where they can digest food. So a digestive tract cavity is present in almost all animals. But additional cavities, especially these cavities that we call the coelom, it's a cavity that is placed inside of the mesoderm and it allows the positioning of other organs for specialized functions. It also allows the distribution of nutrients, oxygen, and the excretion of waste materials such as CO2 and nitrogenous waste out of the body. So animals that don't have a coelom and that don't have these additional cavities are limited in their size. They tend to be very flat and very small because they depend entirely on diffusion in order to move nutrients and oxygen in and to move waste products and CO2 out of their body. So body cavities allow specialized organs for those functions and animals could grow larger once they had those cavities. Another key innovation in the evolution of animals was the evolution of a controlled embryonic development process. This happened by the evolution of genes that control embryonic development. The appearance of those genes led to the possibility of new forms appearing by just small changes in those developmental genes. The diversity of animals was able to take off once those developmental genes were in place. Small changes to those developmental genes could result in big changes in the body plan of the organism. Embryonic development also allows us to categorize animals into two major groups. We have the group of protostomes. This includes most invertebrate groups, such as flatworms, roundworms, mollusks. Those groups are really the Spiralian protostomes. The other major group of animals are the deuterostomes. We belong to this group of deuterostomes, and this also includes echinoderms, which are invertebrates. The rest of the deuterostomes are chordates and vertebrates. So these two groups are distinguished because of the patterns in development. The way the cells orient after cell division in protostomes, when the cells divide, the new cells are placed at an angle from the original cell, while in deuterostomes they're placed right above. The level of determination of the cells in protosomes happens very early on, so when you have a, an embryo that is just a few cells big, if you remove one of those cells, 
all the body parts that that cell was going to form will now be missing. And if it's too early, the embryo will not be able to develop. But in deuterostomes, they have what is called indeterminate development. That is, the fate of the cells isn't decided until much later on. So if you remove one of the cells early on in the embryo, that new cell can actually form a whole new organism on its own. And that's one of the ways in which we can have identical twins. Also, at the blastopore stage of the embryo, the opening of that enfolding forms the mouth in protostomes, but in deuterostomes, the opening of that enfolding ends up becoming the anus of the animal. And the formation of the coelom, that cavity that we talked about, in protostomes, that cavity forms from cells that get trapped in between the, the exoderm and the endoderm, but in deuterostomes, the mesoderm forms these protuberances that start to grow and develops into the coelom. And finally, the last key innovation in animal evolution was segmentation. Segmentation was important because it allowed animals to duplicate their parts without having to come up to, with an entirely new plant, resulted in animals that could grow larger just by duplicating the parts that they already have. So an example of this are annelids, segmented worms, that's how we call them, because of this repetitive pattern in their body, that they just repeat the same segments. But other organisms are also segmented that you might not immediately recognize, like arthropods and their segments are mostly fused into smaller segments, but you can see a milliped, for instance, is, is clearly the combination of multiple identical segments forming the animal. And another animal that you might be surprised that is segmented includes ourselves, chordates like us. You can see evidence of our segmentation when you look at our spinal cord and you see the repetitive pattern in the vertebrae and the repetitive pattern in our ribs. We used to think that segmentation evolved once and all segmented organisms share a common ancestor, but molecular analysis have shown us that segmentation actually evolved three times independently and the organisms that are segmented do not share a recent common ancestor.